Hello and welcome to interest.co.nz. I'm Gareth Vaughan with another of our Double Shot interviews and I'm joined by Sean Hughes who is the departing CEO of the Financial Markets Authority. Welcome in again Sean. Thanks, Appreciate Gareth. your time. Look, so you're, you're leaving um, after I guess two and a half to three years in the, in the job. So we'll kick off and we'll ask you why you're leaving. Well, when I was appointed, Gareth, in October 2010 by the then Ministry of Economic Development and the Establishment Board for the FMA, chaired by Simon Botherway, uh, it was very much made clear to me by uh, the government that this was going to be a three-year term, that it was a set-up job uh, to be the inaugural CEO to come up with the framework and the foundation stones for the new regulator. And I think we were open with each other at that stage that at the end of the three years we'd revisit the, the situation and see whether I wanted to renew and whether um, by then the new board would want to renew me. So uh, I got to the beginning of this year, I looked at my priorities, I looked at what I'd achieved uh, with the team over the last three years uh, and I asked myself did I have the energy and the interest to take it to the next level. Um, I think FMA of the future from 2014 onwards is going to be a very different organisation to the one that we've been uh, that we've had for the last three years. And obviously the big change is around the Financial Markets Conduct Act. Uh, I didn't think it was appropriate for me to sort of get into that and then pull up stumps halfway through and say, look, I've had enough, I've done five years or whatever, and move on. So I thought the appropriate thing to do was to say, look, line in the sand, end of 2013 does mark three years for me in the job. It's been a very, very demanding, but also rewarding and exhilarating experience. Uh, but I'm keen to sort of get back and spend time with my family, uh, to regroup with my family, and to let the next person take the, take the lead from here on. So as far as I'm concerned, great opportunity. I've been privileged to lead this organisation, uh, but I'm just not the right person to take it forward for the next three to five years. So no, no other job you're rushing off to? No, not at all. In fact, uh, right now the most important thing for me is to have a break. Uh, I do need to recharge my batteries. It's been a, a really demanding job. It's, it's not a job that you go home on the weekends and say, well, I don't have to worry about that till Monday. Uh, and I, in particular the last year or so has been quite difficult in that I've been um, living here in Auckland by myself with my family in Australia. Uh, and I think it's important for uh, any family with, with children of my age and, and my wife who's a very busy executive to get the family back together again and to regroup. Now when the FA, FMA was launched there was much fanfare and, and expectation. We'd had the obviously the finance company sector meltdown uh, the preceding few years prior to the establishment of the FMA and one of the, the key tasks that the government set out for the FMA was to restore ma and pa retail investors confidence in, in, the, in the capital markets. Do you think you've got there yet? I think we've made um, some steady progress but it's like cultural change really you, you can't measure it in days or weeks um, and one of the things I'd say is we're seeing it at both ends of the spectrum in terms of that increasing confidence. Uh, obviously the work that we've done in the enforcement and litigation space has I think sent a very clear message to mums and dads that there is a policeman on the beat, uh, that we are following up on where we see misconduct and the action that we've taken so far has been universally successful. Um, but more importantly I think in terms of sustainability, we're starting to see the growth in terms of investors coming back into the market. So obviously the, the SOE program sales has, has encouraged some New Zealanders to invest or at least just to show an interest in investing. Uh, so whether they've actually parted with money or they've followed the articles and they've followed the progress, that's a good sign in itself. Very healthy growth in KiwiSaver, both in terms of new members but also funds under management. Um, and I think overall we're starting to see a resurgence uh, in confidence. But you know, three years is too short a period of time to measure it by and it can't just be measured by you know, heads on sticks. I think you've got to look at some other um, metrics as well. But encouraging signs, and it's really going to be up to Rob to take it through to the next level. And when I first spoke to you, I think it was April 2011, and and I asked you, do you think you can restore investor confidence? And at the time, you said that it wasn't just a job for one person. You'd need the support of of all sorts of people, and including investors, you know, retail investors themselves, the government, etc. Has the FMA received the type of support it's needed from all these parties? Well, the biggest vote of confidence, uh, I think, would be the fact that the government, uh, through the Parliament, has legislated to complete the reform program with the passage of the Financial Markets Conduct Act. And I think that is, is the missing piece in the puzzle that we needed to have finished. Uh, you know, it was commenced by the then Minister Simon Power, finished off under Minister Foss. Um, so that's going to lay the groundwork for what needs to be done. That's, that's a significant piece. I think we've also worked um, pretty hard with our colleagues elsewhere in the public sector, particularly the Reserve Bank, the other peak of the Twin Peaks. 
serious fraud offers the Commerce Commission and of course the officials at the Ministry of Business, Innovation uh, and Employment. So that's been around a partnership. I think we've started to work more co uh, collaboratively with the NZX, seeing good signs there around both you know, capital markets development as well as their, uh, their own self-regulatory role. So again, I'd say you know, good, good start. We've made some solid progress, but it is going to be up to the next CEO and his leadership team as to where we go from here. Now, when you came in at the FMA, you inherited, I think it was 25 um, investigations into failed finance companies from the Securities Commission mm -hmm. and your other predecessors. To what extent has that uh, um, bogged down the FMA moving on and doing other things? Yeah, well, firstly, I'd like to, uh, to correct you a bit. There weren't 25 investigations. There were 25 um, lists or, or names on a, on a file. Um, some of those were investigations, but really only a handful. We've actually had to start the majority of them from scratch. And I understand that there's been some real investor impatience and commentator impatience with the fact that, you know, why is this all taking so long? What I can say to you, Gareth, is that um, we had to start a number of those from scratch, and some of them have been very, very complicated uh, and long-standing. As I sit here today, there's only one that's left to be made a decision on in terms of whether we, we take forward or not. I think we've um, made some really hard calls. I mean, some of those investigations, having looked at them, having looked at all the evidence and assessed whether there were really good merits to take the matter on, we had to say no. And I understand for the investors who've been involved in those failed finance companies, that would have been a devastating um, situation. Uh, but the reality is we're taxpayer funded. Uh, we have to make hard decisions about proper use of our resources and where we think the, the merits of an action might lie. Um, what I'd like to say to, to the incoming CE is that he doesn't inherit, as I did, a large number of historical matters that, that you know, they can be a distraction. They haven't bogged us down in the sense that they've created, um, you know, a story in themselves, they've created a sense of impetus and change in culture and proactivity. They've also encouraged investors, I think, to now regard the, the markets as being well policed. But inevitably they have... Um, been something of an impost on our resources uh, and because they relate to events which happened you know many years ago uh, we've we've felt at times as though we're always looking in the rear vision mirror what I'd like to think is going to happen now is that the FMA of the future in 2014 will start dealing with real-time matters in today's markets so hopefully that's something that I'm handing over to Rob to say we well, mate you've got a clean sheet which is something I didn't inherit when I started you mentioned there's one finance company investigation that you still you still have open, you haven't reached a conclusion on yet. Yeah. What company is that? So it's St Lawrence. Okay. And how soon might we hear something on that? Uh, fairly soon. I'm, I'm hoping that in the next next week or so before I finish up that uh, we're able to make a decision. That just still got a few more inquiries to finish off, so it'll either be late this year or very early next year. And one of the highest profile cases that's been on your plate among the finance companies has been Hanover. Yeah. Now, you have um, uh, laid some civil um, charges mm. relating to Hanover. Uh, where is that case at? Because it seems to be taking an awful long time to actually get to court. Yeah, well, I mean, again, this is something that I can understand for investors uh, and other commentators looking at those matters saying, why does it take so long? And Gareth, the reality is, and I can say this as an old litigator myself, once you're in the system, you're in the system. And, uh, you know, there are very, very heavy demands on court time, on judge time. Uh, and parties to litigation, whether you be the plaintiff, as we are in those cases, or the defendants, um, such as Mr Hodgson and his colleagues, um, you know, they're entitled to uh, a fair process, they're entitled to uh, challenge us on the, uh, on the case that we put to them, and on the evidence that we're going to be relying on. So, you know, we're, we're in the process of what I would call normal civil litigation, uh, where each party is exchanging information with the other side, and we're trying to hone down the issues that are in dispute. Now, um, you know, the, the court itself has not actually set a trial date for that matter. We really are in the hands of the court in terms of the timetable going forward. Um, and obviously, you know, we're keen to get this matter closed as, as soon as we can. We've got our existing uh, asset preservation orders uh, in respect of uh, one of the defendants. Um, so to that extent, you know, we've, we've tried to move this matter along. But look, we respect the court process. We respect the fact that people are entitled to a fair trial. And one of the, the big things, um, or one of the, the big talking points when the FMA was set up was the so-called Section 34 power, which would allow you to step into uh, investors' shoes and take action against, I think, uh, from the, the likes of, of directors, auditors um, and um, trustees. Mm. Um, that's one thing that we haven't seen the FMA use yet. 
I'm just wondering if there's any particular reason you haven't used it and whether you think uh, its use may, may be, uh, the FMA may use it sometime in the near to medium future. Well, going back a bit, uh, you know, when that power was first mooted as being a possibility, I think there was a very strong reaction from some parts of the business and legal community that it could be abused and that the FMA would use it to step into the shoes too readily uh, in respect of every single case that it inherited. Well, clearly history has proven that argument to be wrong. Um, the threshold for attracting the public interest is actually set very high, and I think appropriately high. Um, but until you know, we walked in the door and opened up the books, and as I said, some of those matters weren't even investigations so-called, they were just names on a sheet of paper. Until we actually got in the door and opened up the books and said, all right, what are the merits of this particular matter? We wouldn't have known, you know, were any of these cases likely to attract Section 34. We've looked at on on a couple of cases and we've asked ourselves, is this the right case to bring? In some of those matters where um, there were receivers appointed, they've already brought similar actions in terms of recovery and so there's no point us doubling up. The other thing is that a Section 34 action can lie against a trustee uh, or a director or indeed third parties like uh, auditors or lawyers who were involved in the finance company situation. Uh, in not every case uh, are those individuals what's known as a financial market participant and they have to meet that legal test for us to bring the action. You know, I'd say it's disappointing to some extent that after all the hard work that was done, particularly by the former Minister Simon Power uh, and his officials to get that power up, that we haven't been able to use it yet. But what I would say is that that I think shows an appropriate use of governance and objectivity and maturity in the way in which we've gone about assessing whether the, we've got the right case. I wouldn't rule it out, um, you know, based on what I know, um, there could be one or two examples where we could be looking at that power. But as I say, the public threshold test, public interest threshold test is set appropriately high. And for every person that might benefit from the use of that power, there's a whole group of taxpayers out there um, who are going to be paying for it, who won't get any benefit from it. So that's why you do that balancing act.